I know you don't consider yourself a blues musician. I'm not. Can I ask you um, what would be a negative thing about being considered a blues musician? Or yes. Why you consider what you're not? Yes, it is negative. The word blues is very, very negative because people have a tendency of thinking of the blues like the real down, hard, core, bad living, violent, uh, 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 and all that sort of stuff in life. <coughs> the bad way of li living. And uh, to me, blues is a name that sticks with that particular type of music. Now, um, I prefer myself being called, my stuff be called music, because I play a form of blues, but it's not the negative part of the type of blues. I play very positive blues, something that little children growing up can understand, and, 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 and if they live by what I consider good rules, they wind up being good children, good grown-ups. But listen to the other stuff, man, I'm sorry. That's just as bad as listening to rap to me. Because it's not going to teach you anything to help you. It's going to teach, teach you to hate everything around you. And I, I found that out as I grew up, oh, listening to these guys crying, just like old country music, crying in the beers, everything's bad, nothing's good. Same thing, uh, old country music, that old backwood stuff, and that old backwood blues, and old rap stuff, and now the, what they're doing, they're, they're getting out of music, period. They're using the drum beat and a lot of sex, uh, clowning, acting a fool, jumping around like chicken with the heads cut off, and they call that music. It's not music. It's a lot of nothing, and uh, I just don't go for it. And I think it's ruining our society by the media putting it down in people's throat. Because the reason why they doing it because it's a fast buck. You know, it's easy to make money doing nothing than it is doing something. Mm -hmm. Good stuff is very slow moving, and junk will move in a hurry, just like all these old uh, junk food stores. <coughs> You're selling a junk dish in a minute. Who to get to? The young people. Why keep pushing that stuff down the throat? Why not give them good stuff? Why do you think all our people in our society are going to blow up eventually because they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Because of the chemicals in the bad foods. It's just like bad music. Okay. Can we go back a little ways, and can you tell me <clears throat> how you got into music? Well, my father was a musician, and uh, I patterned myself after him. He's my first influence. When I was a child of five, in fact, before I was born, my mother said. And when I was five, I started tinkering with the old guitar around the house, and I did that for five years. And when I got to be 10, I remember, I picked up his fiddle and went to try and saw on that. And I saw it for a long time. But I developed a sound that no one else has ever developed. My own way of playing. I've been called the most unorthodox guitar player and fiddle player in the world. So be it. <laughs> I'm unorthodox. Well, there's something to having your own sound. That's I right. Everybody tries to achieve that. It's not an easy thing. No, you see, all the music I listen to today, everybody go the easy way out to trying to find somebody that they can copy and they play them. That's it. And, and, and that's all they are, copiers. They're not, they're not true uh, creators in music. And that's why I don't very seldom listen to music because I don't like the idea of what they call music today. I really don't. Is there anything that you've heard? Is there anything out there that's new that's good? Over the top of my head, I can't think of it, being honest with you. Mm -hmm. Now, that's got nothing to do with the person in a way, you know, but it do have something to do with what they're trying to present 
to the audience. As, as your father was an influence to you in terms of music. The biggest. What did he teach you? To pay attention. That's what he told me. But did he not also say something about not pigeon your hole yourself? That's right. And, and, and I mean, I get real frustrated when people want to put a black man in jazz and blues and funk and whatever, leave it the white man figure he ought to put us in. Well, that's wrong. That's just like you. They can't say that you do one thing because of your nationality. They can't say that. You got a brain. You can do anything you want to do if you want to do it or if you're able to do it. Mm -hmm. So no, why not say that? Why not do that? I don't like for people, and, and I correct some thousands and, thousands and millions of people. I love the blues, and the way it's said is very distasteful to me. But when you play the blues, you play it as well as anybody else. Yes, but it don't sound like nobody else. It, it, even my, my, my musical notes are very positive. It's actually talking to you in a positive way, the music itself. Now the words come on top of that. The words are very positive and you can understand it because I'm not playing over, over what I'm saying. And, and I sing with a whisper in a lot of ways. I don't have to strain my voice. And people can understand it. At what point did you feel that you, you could play the blues? And, and actually, before we go into that, what would your definition of the blues be in terms of the way you play it? How would you define it the way you play it? The kind of, the kind of blues I play, I define it as, like I said, very positive, understanding, and it's, it, it's like going to a college to learn something instead of sitting in the street learning nothing and ruining your life. That's what, that's what my blues mean, if you can call it blues. And blues, the word blues itself, is, is something that's very sad, man. And I don't play it. When we... When, when I read an article when you, when you talked about Louis Jordan and how much you liked him. I'm going to tell you why. He was a Guinness singer. He could put words together that was funny. He was a comic singer, put it that way. He was very great at it. That's why I liked him. Would you say that's part of the blues? <sighs> if you want to put him in that category, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Would you call it swing? Yeah, you can call it swing. He played swing music. And he played, like I said, he played gimmick music, a, a comical music. But everything got a trend of a rhythm uh, as you, that you define as blues, uh, a rhythm pattern with a feeling. Now, you take a, a big orchestra like Wayne Kane, how long could you sit and listen to that? Because it's, it's like water running. And you listen to Carl Basie, how long could you listen to him? A long time, because it's got a drive. Duke Ellington got a lesser drive. Duke Ellington not, didn't have the kind of music that, that, that Count Basie had. It's completely different. Uh, Duke Ellington geared to the white only. You accidentally did a tune that 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 the other musician would like, but Count Basie geared himself to the world. He couldn't play as much piano as Duke Ellington, but man, wherever he put one of them notes, he would take, breathe all the time. Wherever he put one of them notes, it would fit. If, at what point did you say, "This is what I want to do. This is what I want to do as my career"? From birth. But when I really knew about it, when I was five years old, this is what I want to do. There's no doubt about it. And as I grew up, I wanted, I listened to all the more blues players, like way back there, man. 
And I would be sad in my heart. I'd be sad the way they sound, the way they play and, and, and their vocal. And I say, I never want to play music that's sad. I just don't. And I won't. I won't. And I will not play spirituals. Gospel, I won't do that either. Because that's sad to me. See, I, I brought up, I was brought up in Texas, and I listen to all this stuff, man. And I don't want no parts of it. When you grew up, was there a lot of, I mean, I presume that there was mistreatment of, of, of the blacks. Not in the city where I was. I was, I was raised up in North Texas, no. But hit in Louisiana, in the mother places, yes. <coughs> Texas had less of that than anybody. San Antonio, white and black musicians were playing together for years. I did it from <laughs> 46. I was an all-white man. Well, that was unheard of in any other southern city, uh, what you call southern city. Well, Texas, to me, is not the southern part. That's the western part, start western. But you start, say, Louisiana and going back to Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Kentucky, all up through there. That was unheard of. But you must have felt some of the racial tensions. Yes, when I start hitting them, them, the mistakes I told you about. How did that make you feel? Well, I felt like they was very ignorant. And it's still, it's still like that, even up north. It's everywhere, man. <coughs> now, I'm just going to be honest with you. What's your nationality? Japanese. All right. We're all what they call uh, ethnic groups. You, me, and a uh, bunch of us. The Jewish people, all of us. But you know, the greatest thing on earth, prove to them that you are not. Get out there and make the world come to you with high respect. Now, like you see them women. A lady walked up tonight, <laughs> my manager was standing there, and I was kidding. You know, I always kid. I said, uh, and Joe, my keyboard player, I said, y'all stand back. Jim didn't know what I was. He said, what's the matter? I said, stand back. This lady coming around the thing, she asked me, could she come and hug me? Come on. It's not a sexual thing to me. It's an appreciation thing of people appreciate what I do in life. That woman come around and, and, and hug me and say, I just love you. I love your, 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 your attitude and I love your music. And then she turned me loose and walked away. And I'm sure that was her husband standing there. But the guys asked me, man, don't let my wife hug you or kiss you. And I make them kiss me on the face. I do not. Let no woman put her lips to mine. Nowhere. Well, I know you have some very strong beliefs about family. <coughs> yes, I do. <coughs> and respect. 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 That's that's the word. Respect. And and if everybody understand respect, that's one of the greatest things on earth, man. Just because some woman or some man. Say, oh, you, you, you handsome, you're the most handsome man I've ever seen. I've had all kinds of things. I said, thank you. I said, I didn't notice. You know, I always make a joke out of things, you know. And people appreciate me. And I don't harm nobody. I don't, I'm not honored to nobody unless they come up to me drunk or just being a stone fool. And I got a way I can get away from them very easy. Are you not a sheriff of some sort? I am a deputy sheriff right now. That's right, in St. Tammany Parish, Slidell, Louisiana, a beautiful little town. How did that happen? Well, like I said, when you respect yourself, others respect you. I respect the police. I've never been in no trouble. I don't give them no trouble. And they, and they love me. Put it that way. I can't hear from saying that. And they asked me to join them. And I got just as much power as in one of the other share, but I never go out there pushing it. I don't know if this is a true story, but I once heard that somebody stole your equipment 
the, the, the sheriff, FBI, the city police, everybody. So, uh, and the marshal surrounded the town and got all my stuff back. That's true. Oh, I had heard that, that you actually went yourself with, and pointed the gun at the person who stole No, it. see, that's a lie. That's a lie. I did not have to do that. I was on the road with Eric Clapton when it happened. He and I was doing a tour together when they broke in my house, wrecked my house, and stole all of my stuff. But it didn't do them no good. They got them and my stuff back. I would presume that this respect that you have, the, the code that you live by, is it correct to assume that you, it comes from your parents? It most certainly do. My father was one of the greatest men in my life, I would say. He was highly respected. And he obviously taught you well. And he was a poor man. He didn't have any money. He was a hard working man, but he was a respectful person. That's great to have that transferred. That's I mean, right. I would presume that there must be so many opportunities, and in your younger age, when, when these beautiful women came up to you, it was still no touch, no look. Oh, I had my moments in life. All young people do. I had girls all over me when I was young. It was fun. But as I grew, I said, what am I doing? Nothing. You're not doing anything when you do that. Running, your, running yourself in the first place. Look, all these guys and die <coughs> from drinking alcohol and running women all their young lives and just to mess up their lives. We just lost another one the day before yesterday in New Orleans. What was his name? Ernie K, is that? Ernie K, yeah. K Ernie Cato. As a young person. Guitar Slim, as a young person. Albert Collin, as a young person. Uh, oh, man, I can name them about 100. And I'm 77 years old. I, I also found it very interesting that you only got, you, when I, the, re, the article I read said that you only got drunk twice in your life. That's true. In the environment that you work in, which is probably a lot of bars, and, as, and you play well, people say, can I buy you a drink? That's true. I refuse all of them. Which is great. I don't drink, so I can say No, I, I don't either. Maybe every hundred, once out of a year, I may drink a half a beer. I may drink it with my manager, I have a beer. But I, you see, I bottle a bottle, buy a bottle of beer, I drink about that much, and the rest of sit there and go to waste. I, I, I don't want it. It, do, it doesn't interest me. And whiskey, the reason why I got drunk twice, when I got ready to go in service, I was scared to death. I, I didn't want to go fight nobody, man. <coughs> it's not my thing to fight people. Unless I'm backed up in the corner, then I'll fight my way out. And the second time was about a lady. My heart was broken, and uh, naturally, that every man that happened to every man, believe me, sooner or later, a woman to do it. And I said, I'm foolish for doing this. So eventually, I got rid of her because she wanted me to get out of the business and drive a truck. I said, You drive the truck. I'm not going to do that, because my, what my father steered me into, stuck with me all of my life. But the ladies didn't. Now, what, what would you sacrifice, your career or that woman? So that, that's the answer there. Was it in... in in all your years of playing, was there ever a time when you thought, I don't want to do this anymore? No. There was never a question about it. No. It, it, a lot of times people thought I had quit music, but I didn't. <coughs> what I did, I moved up to Denver. This lady I had that wanted me to drive a truck, she had a daughter for me, and I got the daughter. She's 30 something now. And, uh, I went to work in a strip joint playing, playing music, and then the strippers come on after I got off and did their thing, and then I went back and played in the club. And I got tired of that because I got tired of being around all them nasty people. 
I went into a, a more a legitimate club. Now what I'm doing, I'm I'm changing over my music from what they call rhythm and blues, what the white man had <coughs> put on the to keep it in the black market. <coughs> but I saw a market that was way greater than you could ever dream of. And what market is that? The white market. But I don't want to lose the blacks either, if possible. I'm not moving from them to lose them. I'm just moving to better my own condition, but they can come with me. But my audience are very, very, very slim with black people because of the music I play. But the music I play is for the whole world and not just for one person. If you notice uh, that kind of music we play today, all the blacks, what was there, were buying their CDs. One black bought my CDs, but I sold all my CDs to whites. How does that make you feel? Good and sad to see the black people so far behind in time. I was told that I sold out. I did not sell out. I said I will not play music for a person. I play music for all person, and I mean that. We had some Arab people sitting out there, man, two guys. I watched them. They were just loving the music. What did you think about the um, old man dancing in front of you? Every time I play, he does that. I, I feel like uh, he's uh, really enjoying himself. He's an old man, and not many men his age will be out there doing what he's doing. And he was pretty well dancing the whole night. Yeah, on every one of my tunes. When I, when I walked out on that dance there, first thing he did, walked up there waving at me. You know who I am. You know, there's two things that I always remember from watching you tonight. I mean, three things. Your music was definitely one, but that old man dancing, and the other one was the picture that the family asked to take of you with the two babies. And and I mean, I thought it was such an amazing picture. And you miss something. All the children, I never forget them out there in that audience. And the people bring the kids around in front, I tease them. I play with them as I'm working. Then I play a tune for them. Swamp Ghost and one of them kids' mother said, Mr. Brown, I'm so glad you played that. I said, my baby just loved that tune. How does that make you feel? Very, very good. Because I never lose, an, I never lose a, 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 a fan. My fan grows up with me. That's right. It's been like that all my life. How did you get the name Gate Mouth? Sure now, that's know. one secret we're going to have to go around. Okay. <laughs> because uh, I'm, hopefully I'm writing a book, and that's going to be the sell of the book okay. when I explain it. All right. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Is it a name that you, you like, though? Like, if I came up to you? Well, said, no, I didn't like it at first, but it, it stuck on me so bad I couldn't shake it off. So I just said, well, I'm going to live with it, and I did. I got one of the longest names in show business. Then that's why it was frustrating me when people can, like this lady come up to me tonight. No, this guy, Mr. Brown, see, I wish you was here. I said, where is it? Well, and it didn't show. I said, well, it's not our problem. I said, no, I'm not personalizing nothing. I'm not personalizing nothing no more. I write my name. My name is that long. I write it and put the date, and that's it. I'm not going to write nobody no letter like a guy say, tell her I love her. No, it's not for me. You tell her. I say, that's your woman, not mine. Why should I say I love her for you? No, no, I'm not going to do that. If I was to ask you what you think your contribution to music or to the blues is, how would you respond to that? A learning factor of the truth. You listen to all of my music and see what I'm saying. There's nothing that's going to steer you left. It's going to keep you going straight if you listen. But you cannot be doing this and understand what I'm saying. You've recorded so many different things. You obviously have your own style, and yet you can use that in any form of music. That's right, and with anybody's you? music. I can take one of your tunes. When I turn it around, it's mine, but still, you got credit for it. 
How do you go about looking for new material for new albums? Well, between he and I, we research, and if it's something I like, I do it. If I don't, I won't do it. That's all. I listen to the positive of it. If it's not positive, if it's negative, I don't want no parts of it. I don't care what, what kind of music it is. If I was to ask you to share a pinch yourself moment where you just thought, wow, this is amazing, could you share a moment like that in your life with music? If you, like a major highlight in your life. Like what would be the, one of the biggest thrills you've had in, in, in your musical career? When I first started professionally in 1947, when T-Bone Walker dropped his guitar and went to the dressing room, ill, Don Robert said, go on up there and sing. He didn't know I could play guitar. He knew I was a drummer. I was a drummer with this all white band in San Antonio back in 46. And so I went on up there and I picked up T-Bone's guitar. No one knew I played guitar but me. And, and I didn't know no keys. I knew one key, E natural. And I started a boogie woogie. I'm the first artist started a boogie woogie on a guitar. And the words came to me like I had known them all my life. I didn't even know what I was going to say or nothing. But I was singing and playing it. To, I said, my name is Gabe Miles Brown. I just got in your town. I said, if you don't like my style, I will not hang around. I said, I had a hard time, baby, trying to get a break. And if I don't make it this time, it still won't be too late. That was my, that was my jump start for my career, and I've went, been gone ever since. How did the audience react? $615 and 15 minutes tips. That's how they react. All black audience. Did T-Bone ever come back? Yes, right quick. And took my guitar to him and never pick it up again. I said, I'm sorry. It kind of hurt my feeling because I felt like I hadn't did nothing wrong. But uh, we never were real close. So that's what happened. And that's, is that a moment where you thought, this is it, I'm going to be a guitar player? Yeah, I, I, yeah, well, I was always a guitar player, but no one else knew it but me. I ain't never played it in no public. You know, nobody knew I could play fiddle. <laughs> Till we were doing that session, and I told Robo I was going to do a fiddle tune, and she could do a what? A fiddle tune. He didn't think that that was feasible for me to do. That was a white man instrument, you know, uh, classical. You see, I don't play classical fiddle, I play a fiddle, as classical as violin. And if you notice all classical players, every tune sound alike. Because he's playing what everybody else told him to play. He can't think for himself. Boy, I cut corners and I, I play the fiddle. I play a fiddle, not a violin. I play a fiddle, and it's the one that's saying this to me. Um, would you say that how would you describe your passion for the music, your personal passion? Well, let's say I think of my father, and I can look way in the past. I look at the present, and I'm looking right through the future. And I feel for the rest of the world. I don't worry about myself. I feel what's going to happen with our world, with the kind of music that the people are cramming down the young people's throats. I, it, it, it's, sad. it's a sad thing. It really is. It really is. Entertainment are very sad. Um, the movies are very sad. Everything is sad. Because these guys can get out there and do anything and everything, and these kids gonna be looking at it and they're gonna grow up thinking that's what they're supposed to say. So my passion is way different from what the rest of the world is, that's all.
I feel like I'm from another planet anyway because I don't think like the people on earth. I, I, I don't, man. I really don't. Hmm? At what point did you think I've that? been thinking that all my life. I've been thinking that all my life. Do you have other hobbies other than music? Like, what do you really love in life other than music? Nothing anymore, just having good friends. And I got a few good friends at home. When I get home, I rest. Then the wife and I get in the car and go visit my friends. Or my friends come visit me. I don't have that many people coming. I don't care for people coming to my house drunk. I don't like that. But uh, I have good friends come by and we sit around. And they they want to hear my music. I never play my music on my stereo unless someone asks. Then I put it on it. And that's all I do. If I was to ask you the best part of the world of the road and the worst part of the road, what would you say it is? Well, the worst part of the road right now, I can tell you, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. Can I ask why? Yes, I was in Arizona. It was so doggone hot, man. I almost fainted. I went to put my hand on my bus. I got out the bus, out the air condition, and I went to close the door in my hand. It was the skin of the bus was so hot it almost my hand almost stuck to it. A hundred and twenty-four, twenty-five. Then New Mexico is high altitude. And uh it was a hundred and thirty something. Colorado <clears throat> was a little cool, but it was way up in the mountains, man. You couldn't hardly breathe. What's the best part of the road? Hmm? What's the best part of the road? The lowland, mild weather. Like today, was beautiful. I got nothing to say about today. It was beautiful. Can you tell me, can you describe a perfect moment on stage? Every time I walk on it. Because I got people out there that I'm working with. I do not like to work. I work in these, a lot of these big auditoriums and theaters. And the first thing I tell the light man to do, give me some light on the people and get that bright light out of my face. Because I, I work with the people. See, when I'm working in clubs or theaters where people are seating, I tease a bunch of people in a very beautiful manner, and they love it. There's a person named Sue Foley. Yeah, I know her. I know her. When I asked her what she wanted to be, yeah, she to I read that. <laughs> <coughs> She's a good person. <coughs> <coughs> she must be out of the country right now, huh? She's actually down in Texas this weekend. Yeah. She was here last weekend for the festival. Yeah, um, she's my girl. I'm sure she would have been here. For oh, her. yeah. Oh, yeah. We're real close friends. Sue Foley. Yeah, I read about what she said, and I laughed. That was so funny. How does that make you feel? <laughs> oh, it's just funny. I guess it's, it's all right. I don't feel anything one way or the other, but it's funny. <laughs> but there's a reputation about you that's this crabby person. No, that's wrong. I'm not crabby. But that's what she said. She oh, well, I don't care. what I told her. I saw her shortly after. I said, girl, what are you talking about? I'm not crabby. She called me honorary. <laughs> I said, you call me what you want. I'm not. I prove you wrong. Um, what is the funniest thing that's happened on the road for you? Can you oh. share a funny experience? Man, I don't know. It's hard to even dig through the garbage to find out all the funny things that happen. Okay. My I, final I don't know. I don't know, really. My final question to you is, what is your legacy in music? How would you like to be remembered? 
as a teacher. You already said I'm a motivator, whether that's true or not. All these guys say I've influenced them, maybe so. Whatever they mean about influence. And uh, maybe I influenced them in getting into this business. And they asked me, uh, what's the first laws of nature in this business? I said, number one, play positive music, get rest, stay off of booze, stay off of uh, 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 dope. Um, and try to play for the people, not yourself. And stop copping off everybody because it's easy to do in a short way out of it. Set up a pattern of your own. It may not sound good for many years, but if you stay on it long enough, you can make it sound good. That's what I did. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thank you.